Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. That helps to keep you a little warmer if you, if you uh, talk when you get the opportunity here. Uh, my name is Jean Kwam. I'm the Dean of the College of Education and Human Development, and I'm very happy to be here this evening celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Tucker Center. Uh, the Tucker Center is located in the School of Kinesiology, which is in the College of Education and Human Development. Um, and I want to welcome all of you here this evening. Uh, I can really speak firsthand about the importance of this groundbreaking interdisciplinary research center, the first of its kind in the nation dedicated to exploring how sport and physical activity make a real difference in the lives of girls and women, their families and communities. Uh, I have been, over the years, very impressed with the research that comes out of the Tucker Center. We've seen um, significant research about concussions, physical activity across the life cycle, as well as, um, as recent as last night, seeing the portrayal of women athletes. Um, and all of this research, um, these examples, have had strong influences on both policy and practice. But um, before I share with you this evening's format and, con and um, content of the distinguished panel, I think it's time for us to hear from some individuals who've been directly influenced by the Tucker Center. I became aware of the Tucker Center when I started looking into PhD programs. I always knew I wanted to pursue my doctorate, and so I uh, developed a short list of programs that I thought would um, suit my research interests of um, women in sport with an interest in media portrayals of women in sport, and I showed it to my um, master's advisor, my previous master's advisor from the University of Miami, and he looked at the list and he said, if you go to the University of Minnesota and you work at the Tucker Center with Mary Jo Kane, you will be set for life. And Center and the leadership of Drs. Uh, Lavoie and Kane is their ability to bring together scholars across the campus here at the University of Minnesota who are interested in sports and sports research. Uh, we're a huge institution. Sport as a field is really kind of fragmented and, and divided off from itself a lot of times. And the existence of the Tucker Center and the leadership of, of uh, the center in pulling those folks together has really created a critical mass uh, for sports research at the University of Minnesota that I don't think exists elsewhere. Uh, the Tucker Center brings a unique perspective on this by drawing in uh, individuals from lots of different backgrounds, trainings, uh, and perspectives to, to really um, focus in on uh, important questions related to physical activity and health for, for, women and, uh, for women and girls. It's really important that an interdisciplinary research center like the Tucker Center be housed at a major university like the University of Minnesota. I think there's a couple of reasons um, or ways that the Tucker Center has been a pioneer in this area, um, interdisciplinary studies and research. The research that's being done and, and the kinds of projects that are produced by the Tucker Center have such a tremendous impact in, in terms of real world applications. To me, the most important reason for the housing of the Tucker Center at the University of Minnesota has been our ability to translate research-based findings for the general public. That, to me, has been the most exciting piece that I've observed and worked with with respect to the Tucker Center. And we are very supportive of the work of the Tucker Center and so believe very strongly in the importance for girls and women having um, equitable access to sport. We have just really loved the work of the Tucker Center and appreciated the opportunity to contribute to this core principle. We became aware of the Tucker Center after we had established a scholarship or a fund uh, for our daughter who died when she was a senior at the U of M. And so we had a meeting with the um, chair of the Park and Rec and the Tucker Center folks and decided it would be a wonderful fit. It, it matched, it just matched very well. Um, 
women and girls in sports, and that was Edie's dream. It's been a great memorial for um, our daughter and our family, and we've loved it. Great video. Now it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit more about what we're going to be doing this evening. Uh, there's going to be four parts to the panel. The first will focus on the early years, meaning the initiating idea or how the Tucker Center came into being. The second part will highlight bringing the T Tucker Center to life and the stewardship of Dr. Uh, Tucker's gift. The third part will feature some of the significant accomplishments of the Tucker Center over the last two decades. Um, and I'm not sure if we'll have enough time to do all of the accomplishments, but we'll, we'll make a good dent in them tonight. And finally, we'll end the panel by focusing on some of the new initiatives the Tucker Center is currently involved with, or what they're calling Tucker Center 2.0. Due to the number of panelists and time constraints, I'm just going to introduce each speaker by their name and title rather than tell you about them now. So um, if the panel members can come to the stage here as I say your name. The first is Dave Madsen, who was a development officer in our college who first came in contact with Dr. Tucker. And I just met Dave uh, when we were down celebrating uh, Dorothy Tucker's 90th birthday um, the, earlier this fall down in Kerrville. So it was a real pleasure to get to meet Dave. Uh, next is Mary Jo Kane, uh, who is a professor and director of the Tucker Center. And last but not least, is uh, my favorite dean, ex-dean, former dean, uh, President Emeritus Robert Brunix. I'm on first. Uh, I'm David Madsen, and uh, I wrote my remarks out because I wanted to keep them short. Mary Jo said, David, you know, we have a very limited time frame. And so when I talked to Dr. Tucker today about tonight, she said, don't worry about Mary Jo. When Mary Jo came to my 85th birthday party, she spoke quite a long time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, anyways, I'm very, you know, really honored that uh, Mary Jo invited me to come tonight. This was a uh, wonderful gift that came about from Dr. Tucker and, and the opportunity to work with then Dean, um, Dean Brunings in the College of Education uh, in his really entrepreneurial style to make this gift happen. And, uh, and Jerry Fisher, who, you, who I think is going to say some remarks later, was the uh, uh, president of the University Foundation at the time and was a great mentor to me. Thank you, Jerry, and a great teacher for, for those of us in fundraising here at the University of Minnesota. Um, and I want to acknowledge, if, if he's in the audience, William Gardner. Uh, I don't think he is in the audience. Well, anyways, William Gardner, I have to say, say a word about William Gardner, because he was Bob Bruning's predecessor as dean of the College of Education, and he hired me. So I give Bill Gardner a lot of credit for hiring me, which made possible uh, my meeting Dr. Tucker. Uh, so, you know, in, in the last course, as Dean Quam said, you know, last month we would, I met her for the first time when we were down in, in Texas to celebrate Dr. Tucker's 90th birthday. And I remember telling Dr. Tucker when, uh, joking with her after she made her gift, I said, you know, she was about in her mid-60s at the time. And I said to her, I said, you know, people who make these kind of gifts outlive their life expectancy. And she wasn't sure she wanted to outlive her life expectancy, but uh, I reminded her of that tonight. And she's, you know, she's doing great in Texas, uh, still living independently. Uh, couldn't join us tonight because it's, it's, traveling is, is uh, not her thing anymore. But, uh, <coughs> but she did say to me tonight, she, and she said it before, she says, you know, this was the best investment I've ever made, both you know, for the joy it's given her and the investment in the, in the talents of Dr. Kane and her team, and really what, what, what was, what's been accomplished through the Tucker Center. And she sees it really as an investment. She was a very good investor herself in, uh, when she was working. You know, she was a, a, a university professor, a psychology professor, but she also just invested well 
in the uh, stock market. And, uh, and she, and some of it, it's just good investments and good luck, you know, like selling just before the market crash and things like that, which uh, she'll, she'll take all the credit for, 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 for timing the market, but uh, she, she, admits that she was just lucky, but she's done well, and she's been very generous to the university as a result of that. Uh, and so you might say, well, how does, you know, how does it come about that you find someone who's going to give a million dollars? And actually, then under Jerry's leadership, after I left, she gave another million dollars. So she gave a couple million dollars back when, you know, back when a million dollars was a lot of money, back in, back in the 90s. <laughs> and it's still a lot of money, but, you know, it's probably, those two million dollars are probably worth more like about five million dollars or more today, right. in, today's, in today's dollars. But, so it was, a, it was a big gift. And, you know, basically, you know, the ingredients are, here's the recipe. It has to be someone who has a lot of money. It has to be someone who's charitably inclined. And it has to be someone who's interested in what, you, what you're doing. And she fit all those criteria. But it also takes one other, there's one other ingredient that's really important in this whole recipe, and that is having someone who has a big idea. You know, because as I've heard others say, this is not original to me, but I've heard others say in the world of fundraising, you know, donors have said, there's not a shortage of big donors, there's a shortage of big ideas. And Dr. Tucker was looking for a big idea. And actually, Mary Jo came up with the big idea. So we give her the credit for that. Because first of all, Dean Brunings and I, we were trying to, you know, deans always want to have things that are, that are really the most flexible things, right? So I first went to her and said, oh, we could have a Tucker chair in education. You know, that would give Dean Brunings a lot of flexibility about how he might deploy that for, for good. And she said, no, no, I want something a little bit more focused than a chair in education. And we got to know each other. We talked, and she told me about her experiences as a student on campus and how it gave her lots of opportunities in leadership. Uh, and I went back once after visiting her, and I went to the university archives, and I looked through the yearbooks when she was a student. And I found lots of uh, photographs of her in the yearbook, as the president of this club, the chairman of this activity and that. And... I, I Xeroxed those for her and sent them to her with a little note just saying, I was curious to know more about your student days. And it just, it just really brought up a whole reservoir of emotion for her to kind of reconnect with her, with her youth and, uh, and the opportunities it gave her by being at the university. And it was a time she was here during World War II. There were fewer men on campus, which gave more leadership opportunities for women. So I knew she was interested in women. You know, she talked about experiencing the glass ceiling in her own career. And so I went back to her and said, well, how about a chair in women in education? <laughs> Figured that's still half the population. But, uh, but she said, no, that's still not quite, you know, quite unique enough. And so we talked about different things. You know, uh, the first time I met Dr. Tucker, uh, oh, by the way, you know, when I first called her, I just happened to be doing my job. I mean, I, you know, it's my job to raise money, and I was in Texas for a conference, and I, as I customarily do, I ran a list of donors in the area, and her name came up. She had been making, giving gifts of $25 a year for 25 years. And I noticed, you know, her 50th year reunion would be coming up in about five years after that. So I called her up, and, and, uh, and she said, well, this is the first time someone had called her not asking her for money. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, well, you know, in full disclosure, I said, I'm the person who arranges for the people to call you and ask you for money, <laughs> <laughs> which were the students, you know, because she really enjoyed talking with the students. At university here, we would have student callers. Um, and my own daughter became a student caller when she was at the University of Oregon and just graduated. But for her four years at the university, she was one of these student callers. Of course, now they screen their calls more than, you know, back then they didn't have uh, all the technology to screen the calls. But, but she enjoyed talking with the students, and I told her I was the one who made that possible. And she said, well, it's not a good time to visit, but call me next time you're in Texas. Well, I didn't know when that would be, but it turns out it was in the very next year I was in Texas on, on vacation. And I called her. And she said, well, you have to come out between my golf game and my bridge game. And that was, that was 45 minutes. I had 45 minutes on my very first visit between a golf game and a bridge game. I had no idea what uh, was going to be possible. I just knew that she would like to visit. She had been giving, she was a longtime loyal supporter. And, um, and I remember our very first conversation, and uh, she, we talked about different things. Dean Brunings, or President Brunings was the new, the new dean then. He was the new kid in the block as dean. She said, well, what's this Dean Brunings? What are his priorities? And, we talked about that, and it didn't really appeal to her. She's a very conservative person, and, and whatever I had to say 
wasn't in line with her conservative ideas. So I just said, well, Dr. Tucker, you know, reasonable people can differ on these things. What would you like, what's of interest to you? You know, and then we just started talking about things and pretty soon my 45 minutes was up. But before I left, she did say, well, what does it cost to endow a chair at the University of Minnesota? And I said, a million dollars. And she said, well, send me some information about that. And that was it. I mean, it didn't, that, wasn't, that was just the beginning of the whole process. I mean, so it didn't, uh, there was lots of meetings after that and with lots of stories that, that happened along the way. But, um, but it's really, you know, in my world of fundraising, it's not about, you know, it's not about persuasion or any skills or techniques I have, although I do, you know, we, it is a profession, we do have skills and techniques, but it's really, the most important skill and technique of fundraising is really just asking questions and listening to what people have to tell you. That's, that's really, that's, that's it in a nutshell. You ask questions, I asked her what was of interest to her, we talked, we had more meetings after that, we talked about different things that would be of interest to her, and learning about her interest, and then learning about what was happening, and learning about what Dr. Kane was doing, it all came together in a beautiful, in a beautiful way. So I will uh, share my anecdotes for, for later, but um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kane about uh, what happened. When Dr. Kane, uh, after, I, after a few meetings with Dean Brunings and we weren't able to come up with something, uh, I went out to the faculty to, to a department meeting of the School of Kinesiology uh, where Dr. Tucker had done her undergraduate work and said to uh, Michael Wade, who was the chairman at the time, who will be speaking later, I just said to the uh, department, I said, well, we have this donor, she's one of your graduates, and she wants to endow a chair. Uh, anybody got any ideas? Well, Dr. Kane raised her hand, or maybe she called me later, I don't know if she raised her hand, but she called me later, and, uh, and that's how things got going on this. So uh, it isn't, you know, it's really, Fundraisers are just the matchmaker. I mean, you know, it, take, it takes a generous person with a good idea, and Dr. Kane had the good idea. So, and that, it's all yours. Okay. Um, thank you, David. So, um, <clears throat> my memory of this is that uh, in 1992, uh, David Madsen did it, indeed come to a faculty meeting in the School of Kinesiology, but let me just give you a little background um, in terms of how I was uh, positioned to come up with this idea. Uh, 1992, as a number of uh, you know, was the 20th anniversary of Title IX, and in the wake of that federal legislation, women's participation in sport and physical activity was skyrocketing. And not surprisingly, the re research was not keeping pace. And I was doing research on sport and gender at the time, and I would go to conferences, and I would hear people make statements about what the impact of Title IX was, and I would say to myself, well, that's a really interesting story, but... We don't have any data on that. And I thought, you know, what we really need is a center, an inter interdisciplinary center that's dedicated to looking at how sport and physical activity impacts girls and women up and down the food chain from the social to the natural sciences. But it was just kind of in the back of my mind. So when David came to the faculty meeting and he said, do any of you have any ideas or projects or initiatives that you're working on that might interest a donor? I uh, and many of you know how humble I am. <laughs> I said, I have a fabulous idea. And reticent. I and reticent. And, reticent. <laughs> and I said, I, I have a fabulous idea. And uh, so, but it wasn't the time. And so we uh, later had lunch. And uh, I told David my dream. But then it sort of occurred to me, wait a minute. He's asking me to, like, start meeting with people to raise money. And... I don't want to do that. I don't like to do that. I need to get promoted to full professor. Um, it's nice. It's nice to know you, David, and you have a good, have a good life. Um, uh, not long after, he called me and he said that he uh, had some more information about this potential donor. He didn't. You didn't give me her name or where she lived, but he said she does not want to be. Um, she doesn't want to reinvent the wheel. She wants to be a pioneer. Um, and so could you just write a proposal that would put your passion and your vision on paper? You were very uh, polite and said, she's conservative, so I wouldn't sort of go down the, the feminist road. Uh, and so I wrote a, a kind of a family values proposal, all of which is true and all of which I believe, which is how can we neglect half of the population <clears throat> from serious scientific study. So I sent it off into the universe which we as faculty do, not particularly expecting anything. And not long after, David called me back and said, now, um, 
this person really loves your idea, but she wants to be a pioneer. So is it true that if she gives money for something like a center that's dedicated to research on girls and women in sports, will she be a pioneer? And I said to him, tell her that if she gives $50 dedicated to the scientific study of girls and women in sports in a research one university, she will be a pioneer. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. So not long after that, um, David called me and I was sitting in my office and he said, are you sitting down? And I said, yes. And he said, well, this person's name is Dr. Dorothy Tucker. She loved your proposal and she's decided to give the university some money to start a center. And I said, how much money? And I remember thinking at the time that she'd given $50,000 and that would just be this extraordinary story to tell. And he said, well, that's why I asked you if you're sitting down, because she's just decided to give the college and the school $1 million to start the center. And I was like, whoa, that's really incredible. <laughs> okay, so now, so that's round one. Round two is Dr. Tucker comes to town. We have a lovely uh, dinner with the, that is sponsored by the college. We also have something at East Cliff when Niels Hasselmo was the president. Um, lots of articles in the paper, you know, from the Minnesota Women's Press to the Daily to the Star Tribune. And uh, so that was fabulous. Um, and then it ended. And then it was late summer. And uh, I remembered thinking, okay, so uh, a center. Uh, now you have to realize I'm a faculty member. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't really know how to do these things. And uh, I thought, well, I think, like, we need some office space and probably um, some stationery and maybe some phone. I mean, I, you know, I just like, I didn't have any idea. This hadn't been going on for like you know, a million years. So I, I don't know if Mike Wade remembers this. We'll hear his point of view in a few minutes. I remember in the late summer going and sitting down and s saying to him, so um, is there like a credit card <laughs> number that I have? <laughs> or is, is there like a check? A checking account somewhere where I can start writing checks because, you know, we've got to get this center going. And he looked at me and he said, what are you talking about? You don't have any money. And I went, no, I wrote a proposal. Remember you were at these events and we have a million dollars. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 Mary Jo, that's an annuity. You can never touch the principal and you get the interest when Dr. Tucker dies. And my life completely <laughs> flashed before me. <laughs> Uh, at the risk of seeming narcissistic, I had this image of something in the Star Tribune that said, Cain ruins it for everyone. <laughs> but I knew this guy named Dean Bob Brunix, who was an entrepreneurial dean. I had been around for a couple of years, so I knew him. And I, I don't know if you remember this, but I set up a meeting. And he was like, hey, how you doing, Mary Jo? You know, congratulations. You had a great summer. You know, Dr. Tucker... And I said, well, actually, that's why I'm here to see you, Dean Brunix, because um, there's been a terrible mistake. <laughs> and we, we have to give the money back. I'm really sorry, but I'm not going to spend the next 20 years of my life raising money. I don't want to do that. So we, I'll call her. I mean, I'll take responsibility, but we have to give the money back. <laughs> and he was like, okay, you need to, like, get a hold of yourself. <laughs> we're not going to give the money back. And here's what we're going to do. And I don't want to step on your line because you uh, had a very creative idea, which I will let uh, Dr. Brunix share. But let me just say one thing when uh, he will tell you the strategy that he used to sort of get us off the ground. And I learned two very important lessons about securing funding for the Tucker Center, and especially from outside donors. The first thing that I learned was that... Um, because the gift was an annuity, we could never touch the principal. And what that meant was that as long as the University of Minnesota never closed or never moved, that money, that gift would be there in perpetuity. And that is something that donors like to hear because they don't want to give money to something that might close in three or four or five years. And the second thing that I learned is that one of the very first things a potential donor says to you when you approach them for a gift is, what's the university's commitment? Because if the university's not committed, why should they be? And because of the strategy that then Dean Brunix used and the support that I also we also received from Mike Wade, which I will share equally generous support with different strategies, and I'll share that when Dr. Wade is up here in a minute, 
Um, those were two very, very valuable lessons for, for me to learn as I move forward and as Dean Brunix convinced me not to call Dr. Tucker and give her the money back. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dean Brunix. Thank you, Mary Jo. Uh, you, anyone who knows me knows that we don't give the money back. <laughs> <laughs> it just goes without saying. <laughs> we grow the money, but we don't give it back, right? Uh, I uh, jotted a few notes of, of things I wanted to share, but I've got to share a little factoid that David left out of his remarks, and maybe he plans to say it um, again. But a lot of things that happen in life uh, are serendipitous. And so David was looking at the giving patterns of people in the state of Texas because he was going to go down there and he was spending some time. And probably Jerry Fisher and some other people taught him to keep an eye out for these trends. But he said, you know, we have a donor in Texas, in Kerrville, Texas, who has been giving us, oh, uh, maybe $100 a year or so. And this year she gave us 1000 Now, that's an incredibly big jump. And I think something may be going on there. And that was one of the reasons you wanted to go see her, because the giving pattern, just a little thing like that, had changed so dramatically. It had gone up tenfold, let's say, um, in, the, in the span of a year. And uh, I think that was sort of the part uh, that, that piqued your curiosity, that this was a donor that might be worth talking to, that maybe she was thinking about giving something more to the University of Minnesota and was thinking about establishing some kind of a legacy. When you talk about the inception of something like the Tucker Center and something that endures for 20 years and has such a profound impact on our local community, our state, and our nation, I often think about, well, what, what, what are sort of the critical ingredients uh, that bring such a, 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 a vision and an idea uh, to fruition? And I, th I think people who, who uh, invest in, in ideas like the Tucker Center uh, have, have big ideas of their own. They're very aspirational about their gifts, and they really want their gifts to, to, to make a profound difference. I don't think these gifts take root without leadership, and that is shared very, very broadly. The story of the Tucker Center is not the story of one person, not even, it, 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 Dorothy Tucker would be the first one to tell you that the Tucker Center is alive and well today because a lot of people really worked hard to make it uh, a reality. And I think creative, creativity and innovation really matter. You know? And you know, thinking, thinking a bit out of the box and thinking about how to build a center that's unique, the, the first center of its kind, and, and then thinking through all the strategies that are necessary to make it work. And Mary Jo has emphasized timeliness. Timing is everything. Um, this was a time when people were starting to pay attention to the, the values and the mission. Uh, of the Tucker Center and those values and, and those principles that, that led to the transformative gift in the organization of the Tucker Center at the University of Minnesota haven't really changed much over the past 20 years. Those values have endured and I think will uh, endure very much in the future. Um, now you're probably wondering why this horse is here. Um, and I, I thought I'd tell a little story because this has in, in part something that to say about who Dr. Tucker is and uh, what it took to really capitalize the center and, and get it started. Because centers do take some money. They take some capital uh, to really become successful. Uh, some years ago, I served as the university's provost for a period of about five years. And, um, and Mark Udoff was president, and he decided to leave for the state of Texas as I was um, thinking about making a transition back to the faculty. And, um, and so Mary Jo came up to me in the atrium of Northrop Auditorium and walked up to me and said, I just got off the phone with Dr. Tucker. And she thinks with President Udoff leaving for the chancellorship of the University of Texas system, that you ought to be willing to consider uh, serving at least as interim provost of the University of Minnesota. And I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm making this plan to take a sabbatical and go back to the faculty. She said, well, Dr. Tucker's really serious about it. She thinks you ought to be in that position and you ought to serve the university. And if you take the job, if it's offered to you and you take the job, she'll buy you a horse. <laughs> 
True story. That, that, that is absolutely true, except she didn't want him to be the interim provost. She wanted him to be the interim president of the university. <laughs> so, yeah, I was interim president, I guess. I was provost leaving the position. Excuse me. So anyway, um, I said, gosh, you know, I'm... <laughs> I really got to have a little bit more time in my hand. I really could use a horse because I, I you know, I, I, I love horses, and I was just learning to ride at the time. And uh, so I, uh, you know, time passed, and um, pretty soon I found myself as interim president of the University of Minnesota. And thanks to a, a recession and uh, a no new tax pledge, uh, we had a $185 million budget cut. And I thought, boy, at least I've got that horse coming. <laughs> <laughs> I've got something to look forward here, to here. And so the horse arrived. <laughs> <laughs> True, truly, this is the horse. And i got to tell you, this horse means a lot to me for a lot of reasons. And it reflects a lot of the values of Dorothy Tucker. She's quite frugal. So I don't have to feed this horse. <laughs> this horse doesn't cost me $500 a month like the other two that I own and, and uh, occasionally ride. And um, it graces uh, my desk, first at, um, in the office of the president and now at our home. And it is very, very special to me. But it, it tells you something about Dorothy Tucker. Hey. I'd know how to bargain. You want a horse? <laughs> <laughs> she never said this. it was going to be a real horse, Bob. <laughs> I said, well, what, what kind of a thoroughbred is this horse going to be? <laughs> you know, I have to say, you know, that frugal, I forgot about that because she used to always say, tell, tell me, David, do not call me until after 5 o'clock because That's it's right. cheaper for the university. <laughs> now, now we don't have to worry about it. We have unlimited phoning, right? But then it was always, call me after 5. And one time I made a mistake and I actually FedExed or something. And boy, did she chew me out for FedExing something to her. She said, you know, you're wasting the university's wasting money. You're wasting the university's money, right. So anyway, now, what does this have to do with the inception of the Tucker Center, you might ask? Um, most of the time when I tried to tell a joke, it really didn't matter. I just didn't tell a joke. Um, and, and it tells, you know, Dorothy Tucker was very successful in, in her day um, when she was a faculty Remember, she was a strong leader on her campus. She was a strong leader. She, 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 she was very certain about what she wanted to do. And she really didn't believe, as Mary Jo mentioned and David mentioned, that it would be a good idea to invest in the Tucker Center or the University of Minnesota unless the university was willing to make a deep commitment. That was one of the principal cardinal uh, you know, ideas that she had regarding the, 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 the significance of her gift and the size of her gift. So when the center started, we had a commitment of a million dollars sometime in the future. And as I told her and I've told other donors, when you make a commitment in a state gift that comes to the university when you pass, you live forever. <laughs> That's just the way it is. And donors love hearing that. Um, but we wanted, we wanted to get the center started. It was time to get it started. It was a very timely idea. It was a very visionary idea. And so we ha started some conversations with Dr. Tucker about whether she was interested in making some commitments while she was still living. And she came back with the idea that clearly involved leveraging her resources. And Mike will tell you his part of the story. But what she basically did is she made an annual commitment. And I can't recall exactly what it was. If it was 50000 40, and you matched it. Yeah, it was forty. And I had started um, a strategy that, I, that I, I used when I was dean and used uh, as provost and used as president. And that was to try to encourage donors, and Jerry can remember this, we worked on this together many, many times, to encourage donors to give while they're still alive so they can participate in the gift. Like the Benson Scholarship was a $10 million commitment. There are literally more than a 1,000 students who have benefited from the Benson gift. But over a period of time, Larry and, and Nancy were convinced that they would get so much more out of life if they gave the money while they were still alive. And that was the way the conversation went with, with Dorothy. And it meant that we had to, to match the gift, you know, one for one. 
and we did. So she made a $40,000 commitment, I think, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the college made a, a comparable commitment. And the department made additional commitments, um, uh, some in kind and some in, in cash, and obviously in space and equipment, um, so that her money probably was leveraged at, at least uh, uh, two to one. And then over time, she, dis she was having so much fun watching the, the center develop and grow uh, that she decided to up the ante, and of course, then she came by and <laughs> wanted every part of the university. And and, the, and when I took these other positions, she wanted to know what the provost office was going to do. And when I became president, <laughs> she wanted to know what the regents were going to do to match her gift. Uh, but all by way of saying that, she she had this big idea, this big vision, and I think she's absolutely and fundamentally right. You shouldn't take money from people. Uh, to support big ideas unless you're willing to invest in them yourself. So I've never, ever believed in um, raising private money to fund the sort of core responsibilities of the University of Minnesota. If you believe it's important to have a Tucker Center and you believe that we should have faculty members like Dr. Kane, Dr. Mary Jo Kane, doing research in this area, you need to have some skin in the game. So that's what went into the inception of the, the center. And before too long, um, more money was committed. And, um, and, and Mary Jo and Mike can tell you, uh, and Jerry can tell you uh, more about that story. But what I have found out, uh, found in, in working on these issues is when you work with donors, it's all about relationships. It's all about stewardship. It's all about making them feel they're a part of their big idea. They're a part of the inspiration that gave rise to their gifts. And that's a very much how this happened. And so she has her 90th birthday in Kerrville, Texas, and people call her, they visit her, they're a part of that. Um, and it, it becomes, a, a, you know, as much a, a, a commitment of an entire community as it, do, it does a, a gift from a single individual or the work of a single uh, person. So that's basically how this all happened and evolved and the money and developed and it grew and it became kind of a magnet for other gifts. You, 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 you um, heard about some of those gifts in the, in the video and some of those donors are here this, this evening and we'll have a little bit more to say about how the, how the center grew and developed. But I'm still waiting for my horse. I haven't given up. <laughs> anyway, I love this one because it doesn't cost me a dime. <laughs> Thank you, President Brunix. How about a round of applause for President Brunix and David Madsen? I just have to share one more little anecdote because it was, it's, I, I, it, I thought it was funny. Maybe, maybe it's not that funny, but when she actually made the million dollar gift, I mean, I actually went there expect, you know, that we, you know, she signed the document and uh, she'd have a broker transfer the money to us. Now, this is, you know, this is before e-commerce, but there was still, people would wire transfer things. So she signs the agreement, I'm in her house, and then she says, well, she hands me an envelope. And in the envelope, it's a million dollars worth of stock. And I said, well, Dr. Tucker, I cannot, I can't be walking around with a million dollars worth of stock, you know, like, that's not a really good idea. <laughs> she goes, well, I, you know, I trust you. You can take it back to the university. Well, I, I said, well, you might not want to trust me. I might just want to go to Mexico with it. <laughs> I said, here's what we got to do. We have to go to the post office and mail this back, registered mail. And it was Saturday, and the post office closed at 12 o'clock, and it was 20 minutes to 12. And I said, we've got 20 minutes to run downtown, get this to the post office, and mail it back to the university so I can, you know, and it, so I'm good in case I get hit by a car on the way home with a plane crashes or whatever. And so we, that's what we did. We, we, uh, we based the university to the post office with a few million dollars. But, you know, the gist of it is Dr. Bruning was saying, you know, is she wanted to accomplish something with her money, and she was, and, and Mary Jo helped her do that. And she feels good about it. Mary Jo has accomplished a great deal, and, um, and the rest is, uh, well, I'll be excused now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, so the next part of the panel is going to uh, be about uh, bringing the Tucker Center to life. So, okay, we're getting ready to open our doors, and what are we going to do? 
Um, so I would now like to call up to the stage uh, Professor Mike Wade and the former CEO and president of the University of Minnesota Foundation, Jerry Fisher. So as folks have heard, um, President Brunick's had an idea of uh, leveraging, uh, well, actually Dr. Tucker's idea, but you were right there, that she would give a certain amount of money every year as long as the college would match it. And even though Mike had told me that um, I was broke, um, which was true, um, there are other strategies that you can use to support folks like me who are trying to get something done. And Mike and the school were and have been enormously generous to us over the years. And uh, I'd like to now turn it over to Professor Wade to hear what he has to say about what he was thinking while all that was happening. Okay. Well, it's kind of turning into Tool Story Club. So. <laughs> I had serendipity now. <laughs> and there is a large amount of serendipity involved with this. Let me tell you, I, I came to Minnesota in, in 1986 because the late Herb Pick, who was a key person in the Institute for Child Development, who I met and knew about because of our common interests, uh, he told me that there was this job in Minnesota and I should apply for it, and I did, and um, I was fortunate enough to be offered the job by then Dean Gardner, and then the chair of Ed Psych, Robert Brunix, who also had an interest in motor development, um, as some of you would know. Um, so I came here in 1986, and um, one of the things that is amazing about Minnesota is that there's an awful amount of <coughs> autonomy in the departments. You can do a lot by being the chair of a department. You manage the budget. You can move resources around. Um, obviously, one has to be fair, but um, it was a great opportunity, I think, for, for a person coming from a department where that was not possible. Um, so when I got to Minnesota, I had met this graduate student at the Institute for Child Behavior and Development at the University of Illinois. And she was working with some very dear colleagues and friends of mine, and her name was Mary Jo Kane. And we kind of got to know each other at the Institute, and I kind of followed her career a little bit. And very early, I think, in the late 80s, early 90s, we had an opportunity to advertise for some faculty, and I gave Mary Jo a call, because I'd been joking with her from time to time about coming to Minnesota, and she said, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, right. So it finally came to pass. I said, uh, Mary Jo, what about it? And she came here. And at the time, there were two folks in the Department of Recreation who um, were not sure that this was going to be a good appointment. But the serendipity comes into play there. These two gentlemen love baseball. Mary Jo came for an informal interview and talk baseball, and they loved her. <laughs> it's how I got the job, actually. So that's sure. sort of how that piece happened. Go twins. Let me fast forward to the issue of the Tucker Center, and it, it's already been, ish, already been talked about here. You need an idea, you need some leadership, and you need some resources. But David's certainly given you a very good background on, on providing at least the startup. Mary Jo came here with an idea, um, and that was that part. And the leadership came, I think, from two people who are quite extraordinary in sort of making things happen. Um, Bob Bruinix is about as entre entrepreneurial a person as I think I've ever met. He was as a dean, he was as a provost, and I think he has been very successful in all of those situations, and in addition to being president. Bob is one of those guys that tries to make it work. And as he pointed out, this million dollars, it's only 5% of a million dollars. That's not a lot of money. And so we had to find a way to make the thing work by giving Mary Jo some time 
to do the things that needed to be done to get the Tucker Centre up and running. And that, of course, was where we could produce some opportunity. Rather than having faculty teach four classes every year, we were able to free Mary Jo up from some of her formal teaching to spend the time building this idea and, and making it work. So in terms of the resources, it's the in-kind resources that we could do in the department to allow her the time to do this and to give her some of the necessary sort of secretarial resources and management resources that are very important. But there was another serendipity thing at that point. Cats. Yeah, so Mary Jo loves cats. That's true. My two cats are named after my dear late parents, uh, George and Iris. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Mrs. Tucker is loves cats. Loves loves cats. cats. <laughs> so she's got That's true. what are they? Statues of cats all over the house. We should have brought some tonight, Mike, yeah. so we could compete so, with this horse. <laughs> you know, the serendipity keeps rolling along. You know, you find a person who wants to give something to the university, wants a, a different kind of idea. We had the right kinds of people, and these things begin to line up. So. That's sort of how it's happened, and that's how it's kept going. And uh, there's a certain amount of ego involved, too. I mean, when people are engaged in making things happen, you've got to have some ego. You've got to have some, you know, clear the decks. This is where we're going. Don't get sidetracked. And uh, I think in all, at all of those levels, with Barb as, as dean and then provost, with Mary Jo being able to spend some important time making the thing happen and to get it up and running, and from our perspective, giving us some release time, giving us some resources and some space, to make this happen, um, that's sort of how it, how it all, all came about. So um, I do want to just make one point here, um, and it's not uh, directly related to the, um, to the Tucker Center, but Dorothy, is Dorothy McIntyre here? She's not. Dorothy was quoted in the paper about the death of M. Joan Parent, yeah. who died on October the 4th, 90 years old. She was a Canadian. She uh, graduated as a veterinarian from the Ontario Veterinary College where I had my first job when I came from England. And Dorothy said, any girl who stands on the field or is in a pool can see Joan smiling. And uh, Joan Parent was born as a Canadian, but she was the first woman to lead the Minnesota State High School Athletic League and was very involved. So Minnesota has a, has a reputation of being at the front edge of trying to do the things that Title IX has eventually brought at the national level. So I think, again, this is the right place for the Tucker Center. Minnesota is the right place for many things. And uh, I think that's what we're trying to do. Um, I just want to say just a couple of things in terms of getting the center going before I turn it over to uh, President Brunix and Jerry Fisher. Um, both, in my view, uh, Professor Wade and Professor, or, well, Professor and President Brunix are, are being uh, a little uh, humble in this sense that, yeah, it was the right time, but let us also not forget that it was 1993. And the idea of investing significant resources in a research center that had to do with girls and women in sport was not exactly at the top of the list in terms of sort of career development. And when you're a dean and when you're a chair, people are always coming at you asking for resources, asking for money. And I just need to say that these two are also visionary and it was our great good luck that we had Bob as the dean and Mike is the chair, because without them, I and all of us would not be sitting here tonight. So how about a round of applause for them? <laughs> so, okay, so the door's open, and uh, we have a secretary. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan Sweet, by the way, who has been with me and us for over, well, for 20 years. Hey, Jonathan, where are you? Jonathan Sweet. So um, I, 
I don't know, I kind of stumbled along, but I, I was uh, smart enough to know early on that when someone w would ask me, and they frequently did, so what do you do at the Tucker Center? I knew that I instinctively knew that I needed to do more than just show them, you know, a reprint of one of my manuscripts from a journal article. <laughs> Not that my manuscripts aren't infinitely interesting, uh, but I, I, I knew that, that it had to be more than that. And so from the beginning, we took the position that we needed to develop projects and initiatives from which our, that, that sprang from our research, don't get me wrong, but that, uh, that had to be more than just a manuscript article or handing them an issue from a journal. And so we started thinking about projects and products, and that, and that, in that sense we became very uh, driven in that way, and you're going to hear about those at the end when um, Dr. Nicole Lavoie, our asso associate director, is going to share with you a fabulous PowerPoint of some of the things that we have uh, done over the last 20 years and then where we're going from here. Um, I want to say something about stewardship, which will reflect not only what um, David has said and President Brunix has said, but again, when this first happened, I didn't, I didn't know what the University of Minnesota Foundation was. I had no, I mean, I didn't, you're fa we're faculty. I mean, I had no idea what, well, what is the foundation? What are these people talking about? Um, just like, you know, is there a credit card for me to get the million dollars? I mean, I didn't know. But I got to know Jerry Fisher. And um, one of the great lessons that I learned from Jerry Fisher was that he said to me, you know something, Mary Jo, this is what people do not understand about the whole notion of giving and being a donor. And that is that stewardship begins, not ends, when the money comes to the university or to the institution. And that we must always be mindful and respectful of the donor's wishes and the donor's intent. Um, and also, as has been said here tonight, developing personal relationships is absolutely the key. And related to that, there are a couple of unsung heroes sitting in the audience tonight who developed very close personal relationships with Dorothy Tucker and still have them. And it is because, as Bob said, it, I mean, it, it takes a village to nurture these kinds of relationships. And so I would like to now uh, acknowledge in the audience Dr. Susan Hegstrom, who is uh, President Brunix's better half, and Kathy Fisher, who is Jerry Fisher's better half. So if you two would please rise. <laughs> Um, with that, I can turn it over to Jerry Fisher. Oh, thank you, Mary Jo, and thank you all for coming. Um, you know, I think this tonight demonstrates the good things that ha can happen when you develop high trust and long-term relationships with your donor prospects, your major gift donor prospects. I like to say the foundation is fiercely donor-driven, and that's a value that was handed down from our board chairs like Donald Dayton and Kurt Carlson. And another value is that stewardship is our most important long-term success factor. And as Mary Jo said, it, stewardship starts when the gift is made and it's not only the genuine thank you letters that everyone thinks of and proper recognition, but it's spending the donor's money the way the donor intended and that you actually make something happen, that it goes from an idea into an actual program. And, <clears throat> and I think in Dorothy's case, to develop a proposal that based on her undergraduate major in, in kinesiology, and then the, the, this idea of you heard about her wanting to be a pioneer, there was no other program doing this kind of research on women and girls in sport and fitness in the country. Now, the University of Minnesota, interestingly, did a lot of work in this area for men. The effect of sport and fitness on stress and heart disease and so forth. Ansel Keys had all those um, treadmills in the, under the stands in Old Memorial Stadium. <laughs> and men would come from their offices here after work and do their workout and get measured and all that kind of thing. So uh, Dorothy, I really did get excited about the 
this opportunity. But you know, there was another thing, David, you didn't mention that was very important to her, and this is part of the total relationship you have with donors. She had been planning before David knocked on her door in a cold call to give all of their assets to another major university where her husband was a professor. And, um, but she was really upset because they had sent her four different communications addressed to her late husband and herself. She had sent four death certificates to the university and they couldn't get the detail right. So one of the things that my first meeting with her was, can you get this right? <laughs> my husband no longer lives, it's about me, and I want to be respected and I want that acknowledged. And I'm, I'm so proud of the foundation's donor management system and, and IT. We're a real leader in the country on this, and I could say with confidence, we'll get that detail right, Dorothy. And we did. And she was always appreciative uh, of that little thing, but very important to donors, like spelling names correctly, uh, getting the address right, and um, sometimes that takes a lot of extra effort when there are multiple marriages and multiple kids and <laughs> so forth. Um, And I just want to salute Bob Brunix and Mike Wade for leveraging her gift <clears throat> so that something really significant could happen and something that would change the world. Every donor, almost every donor that I know has as their primary motivation, they want to change the world for the better in some way. And this idea of studying the effect of women and girls in sport and fitness was so needed at the time and so right as an opportunity to change the world forever and for the better. And look at, I can't wait to see the accomplishments, I'm, I bet half of which I'm aware of, but this center has really, really changed the world. Now the other thing about stewardship is Doing stewardship well and understanding it is really cultivation for the next gift. Because the second most important motivation after changing the world is confidence and leadership. And the third is confidence that your money will be handled well and spent the way you intended it. So I think the kind of stewardship that these three people provided to this gift really helped ensure the follow-on gift and you know, Dorothy's still living and, and at, at 90. And we talked to her this afternoon also and she was sorry that her, she couldn't travel to get here. Now it was my privilege to nominate her for the Foundation Board of Trustees and she served there for I think three terms. And um, I really loved her directness and her Texas swagger and her <laughs> high, strong opinions about everything, not just politics and social issues, but uh, she had strong views and she loved flying up here from Texas to attend the board meetings and interacting with the other trustees and be gaining friendships more mm -hmm. and deepening her friendships with Bob and Mike and, and all of us. Um, now in that process of getting to know her, to do the good listening, I became very impressed with her investing abilities. And she always used to discount this, but at least on two occasions, I know she sold all of her stocks before a market crash. And the latest one was 2008, just before the September crash. I think four days before that, she sold everything and preserved her, her assets. Uh, I tried to get her to uh, help share her <laughs> <laughs> skills with the foundation investment advisors. <laughs> and she, it was, you know, I think not analytical. I think this, these were intuitive things. But she and her late husband, Tuck, 
as she called them, had a lot of fun. They had no children. They were both college professors. There wasn't a lot of net worth there, but they had a lot of fun investing as their hobby and avocation, and as you can tell, did very, very well. Um, I think I'll close there, Mary Jo, and then okay. we can talk more later if you want. Okay. Do, you do you have anything you want to add in terms of how, how it's sort of grown over the 20 years? And yeah, I think the real question is you want me to add anything, but anyway, I'll, I'll, let me just make well, it. I bet he know. wants to add something. <laughs> You know, I read a book in the, uh, probably more than 30 years ago written by E.F. Schumacher, and the title of the book is Small is Beautiful. And buried in this book is one line that I have thought about over and over and over again in just about every position I've held uh, and every, every responsibility that I've assumed. And Schumacher once said, uh, the policy is in the implementation. Mm -hmm. And the vision is always in the implementation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a vision without really good strategies is probably tantamount to hallucinary, uh, hallucinogenic behavior. You know, you don't get anything done. What I think is really important about the Tucker Center, and I think Nicole will, will bring this to life in, in her presentation, is that there wasn't, I should also clarify something about Dorothy. When she made the $40,000 commitment, that was out of her own resources, and it didn't touch the principal of the gift. You mm -hmm. need to understand that. So she actually took the money that came from the million dollars she invested here for her retirement and gave it back to us. And then it was leveraged that way, so the gift was much more generous than than the stated number. Um, but the the other thing that I... I think is really important is that the center didn't rest on its laurels. It developed a set of coherent strategies. Mary Jo talked about it, you know, talking about being focused on specific projects. But one of the most important things the center has done on the University of Minnesota campus is it has brought faculty and students and the community together around the, the mission of the center. And we call that interdisciplinary focus, interdisciplinary work. And in the early 1990s, people were just beginning to think about getting people together across different departments and, and different units of the university and getting them together in centers and institutes to really work in collaboration on big ideas and big problems. So the center brought people together from public health, um, scholars from public health, from medicine, uh, from psychology, from child development, from nutrition, uh, you name it. The, these people were all very much involved, and that coincided with a lot of other major initiatives in, in the school under Mike's direction. But this became sort of a center of people working together across different um, places, and I think it has inspired a lot of other people to think about how collaboration can sort of, you know, um, uh, propel ideas uh, to a much, much higher level. And that was one thing. And the other thing that happened, I think, is it was represented in the, um, the, the video. Uh, Mike Mueller talked very mo movingly about the scholarship that was established in, in, in the memory of their, their daughter. Um, that is Van. Van was one of my colleagues, and one of my friends on, on the faculty in the University of Minnesota, um, Mike's, Mike's husband. And, uh, and there was another kind of, uh, uh, I guess it was actually a gift that was booked, and we hadn't done much with it, the Borgil Strand gift. And I think you and Mike came to me and said, can we, re can we commit this? Yep. Mm -hmm. And that uh, established the annual lecture series that has brought, you know, has brought people from all over the world to talk about big issues that are in the center of the... Um, of the mission of the Tucker Center. So one of the things that I think is really important is to, to reflect not just on how this started, but that was just, that was just the beginning. And, um, and while the beginning was inspirational and the idea was inspirational, what has really made the Tucker Center last for 20 years and will most likely allow it to uh, last in perpetuity is that these ideas, these strategies, the, the sense of how to bring people together around big issues, big questions, uh, big problems, 
um, and then to find ways to make uh, the meaning of research applicable to the lives of people uh, every day in our communities, I think, has been much of the spirit of the Tucker Center that has made it uh, successful. And I'd have to say, you know, that it's, if you look across the University of Minnesota, there are probably about 250 plus centers and institutes at the University of Minnesota. But in my judgment, very few have done as well in bringing people together across, you know, different fields of study, different fields of endeavor. Um, in a highly collaborative way to work on really significant issues that are, are facing us um, everywhere. For example, the concussion video um, uh, that you, you probably have seen, um, until that video was done, until the scholars came together from Mayo Clinic, the University of Minnesota, uh, different departments of the university, um, the research uh, you know, wasn't very clear that the, the concussion issues are more prevalent per capita among female athletes than they are among male athletes. And most people th thought concussions have to do with playing football and playing men's hockey, and, and, uh, and lo and behold, you find out that concussions happen in every sport, and they happen in, in a lot of ways that can materially uh, and adversely affect the lives of people if, if you don't pay attention to it. So it has implications for how you train coaches, how you train athletic trainers. It has really broad implications for public policy and health care and a whole lot of other things that really matter. Uh, that, and that's just one example. So um, I, congratulations on your birthday. Thank you. Your very 20th. Much. Um, do you still have a memory of your, your own 20th? Yeah, that's right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My so, younger days. Your younger days. Anyway, it's been a great ride. and. Um, I've been really proud to see um, the progress of the center over these 20 years and really to reflect on how the strength of the center has grown each and every year. Yeah. Well, uh, let's uh, thank you to all the panelists here. Mm -hmm. And we're all going to sit down as I call up uh, Dr. Nicole Lavoy, who is our associate director, who is Podium. She has a fabulous PowerPoint to uh, highlight what we've done over the last 20 years. Thank you, Mary Jo. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Lavoy. <laughs> I'm the Associate Director of the Tucker Center, and I, I really have to say it's uh, very humbling, and I'm very grateful to be able to take the stage after so many visionaries and leaders that makes this all possible. And I hope you got a sense of that. And it, it is really an interesting story, and I get to kind of put it in a visual representation view of what we've done and where we're going. So as you've heard tonight, the, the Tucker Center came to be um, my job in the next 10 to 15 minutes is to kind of show you what we've done, and you've heard some kind of snippets of that over the last hour or so. And um, I can't talk about each and every accomplishment because there are quite a few, but I am going to give you some greatest hits about our impact and our research. So on this first slide of our timeline, um, you can see a picture of Dr. Tucker. And as you've heard, our doors opened in 1993, and shortly thereafter, um, as President Brunix mentioned, we began our Distinguished Lecture Series, and our first speaker was Professor Mo Weiss, who some of you have had um, as a professor, um, who's now here at the University of Minnesota with us. At the time, she was not. And the Distinguished Lecture Series was an event designed to bring the best and brightest scholars to study the most cutting edge and current issues around girls and women in sport together to start the dialogue. In 1997, um, we completed a groundbreaking research report in partnership with the President's Council of Physical Fitness and Sport on the benefits that girls derive from physical activity and the barriers that prevented them from reaching their full potential. And we distributed over 20,000 of those worldwide um, over the last um, 10 years, and I'll get to our 10-year update in a minute. 
And you can also see that 1997, the first of our five endowed scholarships and fellowships was established, and you heard Mike Mueller mention that was in honor of their daughter, Edie. Mike, where are you and Carrie? There you are, right there, so right down here in the front. In this slide, uh, you'll see, as Dr. Kane mentioned in her remarks, we have really made a conscious effort to create research-driven projects that make a difference. And in this part of our timeline, you can see a variety of initiatives related to our research and community outreach on sport media and the physical activity of girls. In 2004, uh, the Mueller's continued their generous support by establishing a second endowed graduate fund. And in 2005, I was hired and recruited away from the University of Notre Dame at the Center for Sport and Character to come um, and be the associate director. And almost immediately, I began working on the 10-year update of our very popular 1997 report. And this report was and continues to be distributed digitally for free and in print copy, and we're, I think we're down to the last 10 in our last box. So I think that tells me that the next one is fast approaching. In the last five years, we've expanded our educational opportunities and fellowships for undergraduate and graduate students, and to date have mentored 12 summer interns, including four McNair Scholars. And for those of you who don't know what the McNair Scholars um, program is, it's designed to help first-generation college students apply and succeed in graduate school. And many of our former interns are now in doctoral programs across the country um, in various disciplines. 2011 was a very busy year for us as we hosted an international conference on girls and women in sport with over 150 gender scholars. And we worked with Twin Cities Public Television to produce the first of its kind and Emmy-nominated documentary on the impact of concussions on female athletes. To date, with that DVD, we've distributed over 800 copies. It's been watched over 3,500 times online um, for free. And it's been shown on TPT over 40 times. So it's had a really great impact, as President Brunix mentioned. Also in 2011, we established the Tucker Center Film Festival. And we um, came up with this idea, actually we didn't, Austin Stair Calhoun did, who's somewhere in the back, I believe, um, said, I have this great idea. We do research on sport media and we never see female athletes in, on the big screen in major sport films, so we should do a film festival. And I said, that's a fantastic, big idea. And I said, let's make it happen. So we have and we've enjoyed um, many iterations of that. And um, our next iteration will be coming up in early February, the week that we honor National Girls and Women's Sport Day. And we are going to be featuring two films of legendary coaches of Pat Summit and Vivian Stringer. Um, and those films will be coming to us courtesy of ESPN and ESPNW and their 9 for 9 series. And if you watched those this summer, they were fantastic. And I have just received word that ESPNW is going to continue that series because it was so popular. So yay, that, that's really important. So on our last timeline slide here, um, 2012, you can see it was a big year for us. It was the 20th, uh, 20th, 40th anniversary of Title IX, and we were asked to speak at a variety of conferences nationally and internationally on this important law and its impact on girls and women. During this time, we also expanded our cutting-edge research on females in positions of power in sport. Um, context and media portrayals of female athletes. Our three summer interns, who I think are in the audience, some of them, where are you guys? There they are, um, worked long and hard hours with us this summer to prepare um, some of the initiatives I will talk about on the next slide. And it was the first summer we were able to provide our summer interns with a stipend based on the generous gift of two of our donors. Because of our impact and our outreach and our research, um, we are often called upon um, for our expertise to comment on various 
topics. And this is a slide that shows you the impact of headlines across a variety of media outlets. Um, and this is just over the last three years. You can imagine what the slide would look like um, over the last 20 years. And those relationships with the media, many of who are in the audience tonight um, talking about stewardship and it's all about relationships, we, we cultivate those relationships with the media. So when they need something, a, a, a soundbite or some expertise or some evidence-based information, they come to us and ask us to contribute. Um, and these relationships have been with local and regional media as well as cultivating relationships with some national media, um, whether it would be print, digital, or broadcast media. So the public scholarship that the Tucker Center as you can, has done, as you can see, has had an impact across the country and, and around the world. And as our work has grown and responded to the demands of the ever-changing landscape of women's sport in the post-Title IX era, as women's sport has evolved, so have we. Literally, we have gone from a black and white newsletter um, to our more colorful, um, modern looking newsletter. And not only has our newsletter changed and evolved, so has our logo. And some of you may remember this and our next iteration and our newly launched and um, refreshed Tucker Center logo that you can now see um, on our website. So along with our refreshed logo, we have um, entered a phase that was mentioned before um, called Tucker Center 2.0. And we're really excited about this next phase because there's some new initiatives that we are launching to honor and continue our legacy of excellence. So along with our Refresh logo, this is our old website, we have refreshed our website and redesigned it thanks to the very, very hard work, again, of Austin Calhoun and Brenda Singer and Jonathan Sweet, who have worked tirelessly on this project. It looks fantastic. It has the same great content, but it's much easier to navigate. And I really invite you to visit our new website, same URL, tuckercenter.org, and, and check it out and give us feedback. So finally, we are engaged in two new collaborative initiatives. The first is the production of a second video with Twin Cities Public Television about the media coverage, or should I say the lack of media coverage, of female athletes. And you have perhaps heard Dr. Kane talk about her seminal research in this area. Um, this project really grew out um, of that line of research. And I've seen the rough cut, and it's amazing. And I invite you all to turn in, tune in. Um, on December 1st when it debuts on TPT to see the full-length um, report. The second of our new initiatives is a collaborative research report uh, with the Alliance of Women Coaches um, on women coaches. Some of you know that in 1972, um, when Title IX was passed, uh, about 90% of women athletes were coached by women coaches at the collegiate level, and currently that number is about 40%. So we've had a decline. So while you heard earlier, participation rates are skyrocketing of girls and women in sport. Media coverage is declining to near an all-time low. And the percent of female coaches coaching women is at an all-time low. Um, so our two research initiatives are really a, a designed to address these troubling issues um, for those of us who study gender and sport. So to this end, um, we will also be host hosting our first ever Women Coaches Symposium in partnership with the Athletic Department and the Alliance of Women Coaches, again, that will follow our film festival. So we'll have the film festival at night and we'll have the coaching symposium on Friday. So as you can see, we have a lot to celebrate, and we have a lot of exciting initiatives to come and to be proud of. And as you've heard, these initiatives and running a center takes a village. And part of that village are many of the people that are in this room, our former students, our current students, our staff, our faculty, our colleagues across the university. So I would like at this time to really thank Jonathan, Julia and Tori, who had the camera down here, 
um, who have worked really hard to make this event and many others happen. And can you guys, and, and our former Tucker Center graduate students and, and affiliated scholars, can you all just kind of stand up? I know you don't want to, but this is about you as well. So thank you. And I can tell you this is one village that I'm really proud to be a part of and honored and, and excited to come to work um, each and every day. So as we think about our new initiatives, you can always keep track of us on our digital media platforms, like us on Facebook and tweet us at Tucker Center um, and follow our latest endeavors on our website. So I really thank you for coming and supporting the work we do. And I really hope that um, if you aren't currently involved, you find a way to get involved with us in the future. And as for the next 20 years, stay tuned. <laughs> So now to end, we're, we'll do a brief Q&A and comment. Um, so I'm going to invite all our panelists back up to the stage. If you have questions or comments, we have two mics with um, some students. So if you have a question or a comment, Julia or John will traverse the steps. So um, panelists, if you can come on back up here, that would be great. And Gary, if you can just dim that um, screen, that so the. Thank you. All right. Any questions or comments from the audience? Hang on, wait for the mic because we're, we're taping it. <laughs> Thank you. I know this is uh, something you want to study or planning on studying, but, but why do, what do you attribute the severe decline of uh, women uh, in the coaching business? Uh, uh, there must be a number of reasons, but uh, something's happened in, mm -hmm. in the last 10 or 15 years, and it really probably hasn't been related to money because the salaries probably are higher than they've ever been. So that's not a uh, detriment. So what do you see there? Mm -hmm. Well, it's ironic you're giving the microphone to Julia. <laughs> she and I uh, um, have written a, a paper on this about the barriers. And you know, we could spend another hour in here about what the research says about why there's been a decline. Um, I think what the bigger question is, is how can we reverse the decline? What can we do about it? Well, how can we use the evidence that we have to get that line to go back up. So that's really, I think, what my focus and those of us at the Tugger Center who think about this want to study is how can we devise evidence-based strategies to get that line to start going back up because the barriers and the issues around this are really complicated. Regent Devine. What have been your greatest challenges to continuing to add uh, more fundraising efforts in order to support the center and women's athletics in general? Well, I think the biggest barrier is that just that money is very tight and that we're competing with a lot of different people. Um, a strategy that I use and which I learned from uh, Professor Wade and, and uh, President Brunix is that um, w except when we're trying to raise money for specific initiatives like the two videos or the two research reports, um, when people approach us and want to make a contribution, I always, believe it or not, I always think in terms of endowments or annuities like scholarships and fellowships so that we will have them in perpetuity. That's the most important thing so that my successor doesn't have to always be scrambling for money. That's, that's the biggest thing for me. I don't know, Nicole, if you want to say that. So, I mean, it's just tough to go out and just say, please just give us money. It has to be around a specific initiative or project or scholarship or fellowship. That's the key. 
Mary Jo, I might add that sure. <clears throat> one thing that gives me some hope is that historically men dominated all the decisions in philanthropy, decisions by couples and foundations and so forth. But in the last 15, 10 to 15 years, women are, have emerged and are much more involved and, and making many, many more decisions. And my thought is that uh, as, you know, women have always had more than half the wealth of the country, but now I think with these decision dynamics changing, that gives me quite a bit of hope for programs like yours. Well, I'm just curious. We recently had another championship for the Minnesota Lynx, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the media coverage that was given to the Lynx both in 2011 and then this year as well. Well, I think it has gotten locally, I think, much, much better. Um, it's still n nowhere where it needs to be because if you make parallels with um, – performance and accomplishments of men's sports versus the women's sports in this town, uh, the Lynx should be the lead in every story above the fold every single day, um, right? So how about those Minnesota Lynx? How about a round of applause? And speaking of lack of coverage, I, I think um, last uh, year when the women's hockey team and the championship in the Frozen Four was not covered on television, which absolutely was just outrageous and unthinkable if it were men's hockey or any other sport in a parallel situation. I'm hopeful that that was a real watershed moment and a wake-up call for the local media and for the Big Ten Network to say, we just can never have something like this ever happen again. Um, because if it has to do with performance and interest, there is a desperate need for more coverage of women's sports. That's what I think. So how about those Minnesota Golden Gophers, too? Um, going along with the whole media note, how do you see ESPNW kind of growing and supporting um, just kind of media coverage efforts on women's sports. Mm -hmm. um, ESPNW, for those of you who don't know, is a brand extension of ESPN. It's not a, it doesn't have its own channel or network yet. Um, they're in their fourth year, and they um, were a brand spinoff because they thought they could capitalize on the female sport fan and women who love sports. So it's not a brand extension only about women's sport. It's about female sport fans and women's, uh, female fans of sport. And I think it's a really good starting point. Um, I think they're doing some great things. This 9 for 9 series is a really good example of that. And I think as that brand grows, they're, it might – They. I just looked at the stats this morning – um, I got an email. They get over f six million hits on their website a month. So there are driving traffic, which it is saying there is interest. And I think it's only going to be po more and more positive as the brand awareness of ESPNW grows. And what Dr. LaVoy neglected to tell you is that she is a member of the advisory board of ESPNW. So she has a role in what happens there. <laughs> um, so I'm curious how you feel your research um, positively impacts women in sport and how, uh, how we can get the general public to see that female athletes are just as much athletes as male athletes. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, let me start with the media stuff and then... Um, so uh, one of the things that I, and I'm sure you all have heard forever and ever and ever, is that um, sex sells women's sports. And um, as I said uh, in the event that we had last night and on the video that you will see uh, on TPT, um, 
no matter where I've given my sort of PowerPoint on showing very powerful images of female athletes, um, the show and, and and showing them from being on court and competent to off court and highly sexualized and objectified, no matter where I give this presentation uh, in front of hostile audiences or supportive audiences. At the end, someone will always stand up and it becomes the showstopper. They will stand up and say, Dr. Kane, um, these images of sexualized female athletes are either okay or I don't know what you're so concerned about or they're outrageous, but they will always say, but sex sells women's sports. And I was driving home one day after about the nine millionth presentation and I thought to myself, you know what, um, scholars here, we don't have any data on whether or not sex sells women's sports. There's never been anybody that's done a study that has looked at on the one, you know, in year one, showing female athletes as highly competent, and then in year two, showing female athletes as highly objectified, sexually objectified, and then tracking, um, you know, their, the, the interest from the media, the corporate sponsorship, the attendance, I mean, there's no data. And when you ask marketers, well, show me the data that you have that shows that selling sex in women's sports puts more stands in people in the stands. And they, don't, they didn't have and don't have any data either. So one of the things that we've done over the last couple of years um, is we've conducted research studies that have never been done before in which we have first asked focus groups of 18 to 34 year old males and females, the sweet spot of sport marketers, or for marketers, and 18, and I'm sorry, 35 to 55 year old males and females. And we, um, we showed them images randomly Sorry, I'm giving you a little dissertation here on a study, but it matters because it's the first time that anybody ever has hard empirical data on whether or not sex sells women's sports. So we asked these focus groups and then f elite female athletes themselves at the University of Minnesota in Connecticut, we showed them randomly four images ranging from on-court athletic competence to off-court highly sexualized images. And then we said to these consumers, which one of these images makes you most interested in reading about watching, attending, and buying a season ticket. And what we found was that not only were the sexualized images not increasing interest, they actually were highly counterproductive because they, they offended the core base of women's sports, meaning women and dad, older men, meaning dads with daughters. And they all those groups picked competence over um, sexualized images. Now the younger males, 18 to 34 year old, did pick sexy babe images more than any other focus group. But when we said to them, therefore does this make you want to, you know, go see women's sports, they said no, it makes us want to buy the magazine, but that's not what they look like when they play sports, so why would we go see them then? They also, cho they also chose competence as their number one choice. And the reason that I'm making this point is that that is the kind of research that has come out of the Tucker Center. My colleague, Nicole Lavoie and Janet Fink at UMass Amherst, they should get credit for this, as well as our graduate students and our summer interns who helped us with this research. Speaking of taking a village to do a study, the key point here is that it, it allows us to put empirical data into the hands of sport marketers and decision makers to say, you are wrong when you say sex sells women's sports. In fact, it does just the opposite, and here are the data to show it. So that's a little tutorial on how our research makes a difference in people's lives. And I can tell you um, another line of our research, the two research reports you saw from the President's Council on Developing Physically Active Girls, which were interdisciplinary reports. Out of that report, um, one of our doctoral students who now is finished, Chelsea Thule, who's sitting back up there, you know, said to me, we don't know a lot about specific populations of girls, including East African girls, who we have one of the largest populations in the country, right in our own backyard. Um, she has taken that research report and translated evidence-based strategies and working with that population to help them get physically active. And now as we are working together with the College of Design to work with the girls and community participation action research to design clothing with them that they can wear in culturally relevant ways so they can be physically active in their communities. And that is another way that we make an impact in our own community and hopefully 
across the country. So mm -hmm. good job, Chelsea. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes, and we just hired her because she's that fantastic. She's going <laughs> to be joining our faculty shortly. So um, I think I'll probably wrap this up now. And before I do that, I want to, um, because I was remiss in my um, comments before, to specifically thank uh, Gopher Athletics, Norwood Teague, and Beth Getzer in the room for their support of our report and our Women Coaches Symposium. And um, again, it takes a village, and they're part of the village. And just one other last thing to say, speaking of taking a village, um, we were able to hire Dr. Thule because of the generosity and support of bringing another uh, faculty position into our department. And that happened because of the current director of the School of Kinesiology, Professor Li Li Zhi, who's right here in the audience. So thank you, Professor Zhi. So that's it, folks. Um, we, uh, there's some food and drink out there for you. I know it's a little late, but thank you all for coming, and happy anniversary, Tucker Center. Thank you all.